talk about the gender pay gap. Oh crap! When we talk about the gender pay gap, there are a lot of numbers floating around. And the question is, do women in equal position to men actually earn less money? Well, there is a lot of arguing going on about it. Passionately, I must say. Women earn 22.8% less. No, it's only 13% less. No, it's even less, less. Anyway, gender pay gap is not a thing anymore anyway. So what is going on here? And why are we arguing about numbers? Put the chips down, science friends. And grab a cup of coffee. Let's go. Hello my science friends, welcome back to my channel. Today's video is a little bit off topic when it comes to chemistry, but very much on topic when it comes to people like me, females in science. This week, on the 18th of September, was International Equal Pay Day. If you follow me on social media, you already know that I made a short video about the Australian Equal Pay Day back in August. And given the response to that, I thought we should dig into the science of this topic a bit deeper and also have a look why this is still relevant. The maths behind the numbers. A lot of the discussion around the gender pay gap and the associated numbers builds on the fact that the maths behind the statistics of it are not very clearly presented. But it's actually not that hard. Let's have a look at this. The national gender pay gap calculated from the Australian Bureau of Statistics survey on average weekly earnings uses the average weekly ordinary time earning for men $1,938.30 and for women $1,886 and calculates a gender pay gap of 13% as of May 2023. So translated into real life, this means in Australia, for every $1 every man earns, every woman earns 87 cents. This, however, only looks at full-time workers and their base salaries. There are more things to consider though, which is why the Workplace Gender Equality Agency, WGEA, calculates a different gender pay gap, taking into account overtime work, compensation, bonuses, additional payments, full-time and annualized part-time work, as well as casual workers. And using all of this data, they calculated a gender pay gap of 22.8%. This is the latest data from 2022. The data from 2023 will only be released in November. So compared to the national gender pay gap with the corrections of additional earnings and working hours, this means for every $1 every man earns, every woman earns 77.2 cents. Quite the difference. Countries in Europe, like Germany where I come from, calculate the gender pay gap similarly but state three different numbers. The overall earnings gap, equivalent to the WGEA calculation taking all earnings into account. The unadjusted gender pay gap, equivalent to the Australian Bureau of Statistics, looking only at the overall average of base salaries and then the adjusted gender pay gap, which takes into account that men and women often work in very different jobs. A stereotypical example of this, doctors might be predominantly male, nurses predominantly female, which in the European's point of view can be used to explain the huge wage difference between the genders. Reasons for these differences include 1. Women spend more time raising children or caring for elderly parents, so women work more often part-time or interrupt their career for longer. But careful, this can be confusing. We are discussing hourly salaries, but part-time work and career disruptions don't just lead to less working hours, but are often also accompanied by a lower hourly salary rate. And women are more likely to work in lower paid jobs, industries or positions. Now people can argue how relevant some of these numbers really are, as the Australian ones only look at all weekly average salaries irrelevant of their occupation, when really we should be looking at the average salary of men and women in the same job. And it is true that the gender pay gap is lower in this case. See the adjusted gender pay gap in Germany. But data from the Australian Taxation Office statistics show that men have a higher salary than women in the equivalent job in 95% of all registered occupations. Okay, 
Now that we understand the numbers, we get to the important question. Why do women still get paid less than men? One of the main reasons, yes, even in the 20th century, is discrimination. This American study took academic professors and told them, please look at this CV and imagine this person is applying to be your lab manager. What the profs didn't know was that there were two CVs circling around, which were completely identical, except that one had the first name Jennifer, so female, and one had the first name John, so male. Interestingly, Jennifer was judged less competent and less fitting for the job on average, and she also received less mentoring, so development opportunities. And John got a lot more salary to start with. Careful though, this graphic looks a lot more dramatic than it really is. The y-axis doesn't start at zero, but the difference is between about 30,000 and 26 and a half thousand, which still isn't fair. Right, so discrimination is one thing, but there's a whole range of other characteristics that can influence this, but are not measurable. Things like willingness to take risks, or opportunistic behavior, or self-confidence in contract negotiations, etc. Are there differences between men and women on average? Most people would probably answer from experience and impressions, yes. But are these differences severe enough to influence salaries like that? Maybe yes, maybe no, maybe sometimes. Which is why the unadjusted gender pay gap, the WGEA calculated 22.8%, has an important role and an interesting message to this. Some of the reasons we looked at earlier to explain the difference in working behavior between women and men come from the same or similar reason. Time for family. If it is raising kids or caring for the elderly, this time comes at a cost. It is always a trade-off. Either time for this or salary. In the literal sense, time is money in this regard. Women pay for their time invested in family with a lower salary. You can see this as a financial female discrimination, or you can look at this in a more general sense and see it as a financial education and care discrimination. Is this fair? Let's just ignore elderly care for a moment and focus on raising children. Then there is the age-old, much-used argument Having children is private pleasure and ballast for each and every one to their own. Nobody forces anyone to have kids and do this trade-off. I find this argument highly problematic when our society is based on reproduction and we're literally dependent on a stable and sustainable workforce. And in Australia, there is not a whole lot of support for fresh parents to stay home for a long time. So, by law, and financially, women aren't enforced to stay home longer than necessary and as long as they do on average. So people make the argument It's their own fault and they are responsible for the decisions they make. And with that, my science friends, we reach the actual crux of the whole gender pay gap debate. The actual crux freedom of choice. In the reasons for the difference in salary, there is only a minimal percentage based on differences in education and qualification between men and women. So the assumptions that women tend to have lower paying jobs because they're missing the qualifications or education for higher paying ones is wrong. At the end of it all, it is the decisions that women and men make about their career. And this is where the biggest potential for disputes and arguments lies. Why? Because there are two camps. Camp A. Men and women decide freely about their career and family time. From a stay-at-home mom or dad to a career woman or man, most people decide freely about what they want to do with their lives. And men and women, on average, just want different things. Or Camp B. Men and women are subject to social and societal constraints. For example, women feel pressured to care for family. Men feel pressured to bring home the money and both stops them from doing what they actually want to do. And the issue is, it is really hard to discuss this because we don't have maths and numbers as a basis for the argumentation. Still, we can embark on some logical thought experiments on the topic of freedom of choice. And I would like to throw in two of them right now. One, freedom of choice on paper doesn't automatically lead to freedom of choice in real life. The newest fad of startups in the US is something called unlimited holidays. No rules, 
all freedom to take as many days of paid leave as you want. You can decide for yourself if you want to go on holidays for half a year or a week. And what do you think happened? Yep, people took a lot less holidays than anywhere else because nobody wanted to be seen as the lazy person that decided that they deserve more holidays than anybody else. And in the worst case scenario, risk a dismissal. Two, social differences are subject to a hamster wheel effect. Not too long ago, women used to stay at home and men were the money earners of the family. Since then, a lot has changed. But let's imagine an average couple of today where the man earns more than the woman and this couple now decides to have a child and that one of the parents stays at home with the kid for a while or at least spends a decent amount of time at home. How do they split this up? From a purely economic point of view, only one way makes sense. The man who earns more money doesn't cut back on work, but the woman who earns less does. Of course, you have the freedom to choose otherwise, but you have to be able to afford that choice. So the man continues to go to work, continues to gain experience and works towards a salary increase or a promotion. The women doesn't. The result, the salary gap between the two of them only increases over time, which means different initial situations reproduce differences. Right. These were only two examples where constraints from the outside are not as easy to overcome as we like. It is very hard to imagine a situation where people are really free to choose and what those choices would then look like. Apart from that, money is not the only valuable thing in life. Maybe future generations will be better at not looking at the gender pay gap, but also the gender pressures time with your family gap. And then there is the final question I'll leave you with. Why are the career choices that are female dominated, like nurses, aged carers, kindergarten teachers and the like, paid so much less when they are the foundation of a working society? If anything, the global pandemic showed us that nurses are not fairly compensated for their work. Maybe that's a better topic for arguments, disputes and discussion. And with that, I'll point you to the comments section. Let me hear your thoughts on the topic. I'll see you in my next video and until then, as always, stay sciencey.